Acts 17 because that is where the church of Thessalonica uh, got its establishment. Uh, Paul was on his second missionary journey, and he's going through there. So if you will, uh, read this with me in Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 13. Luke, who is writing Acts, the historian slash doctor, he says this in Acts 17, 1. Now when they, that is Paul and his comrades, had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead and saying, this Jesus, who I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of his, the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, namely Jesus. And the people, in verse 8, and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things, and when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Verse 10, the brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the Jewish Synagogue. Now, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them, therefore, believed with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. And finally, verse 13, but when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. That gives us just a good, healthy framework to get into 2 Thessalonians. So you can go ahead and turn there now. But I wanted us to get that idea of how this was established. Like I said, the second missionary journey of Paul. I actually want to draw your attention to um, this specific point. Oh, it's actually not up here. I tricked you. Stay in Acts 17. Look at that word in verse 6. Look what they actually get accused of there. I thought that this was interesting. That of all the things that they could accuse the Christians in Thessalonica of, Look what it says in Acts 17, 6. Quote, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. That word turned is used three times in the Greek in the New Testament. Once here, once in Galatians 5, 12, and in Acts 21, 38, I believe it is. And the idea there in Acts 21, 38 is Paul is on trial against the Jews, surprisingly, not surprisingly. And what is happening is that they think that he was the leader of the 400 assassins that went out. So there's revolutionary overtones with that specific word in the Greek. So when it says in Acts 17, 6, what they are really saying is this Christian movement is turning the world upside down. It is causing a revolution, so to speak. That's the picture there. And so I thought that would be a good framework for us to look at 2 Thessalonians. Okay, now you can turn there. I promise I will not trick you again. So go ahead and get to 2 Thessalonians. As we get there, I'll give you just a quick word on 1 Thessalonians because if you have 2 Thessalonians, you inevitably have what? There it is. Got three people on top of it right on. 1 Thessalonians. So I'm not going to make talk a lot about that. But because Paul had to take a leave of violence, so to speak, because remember, they followed him to Berea. I mean, he's leaving town prematurely, and they follow him there and stir up the crowd there. And so he just has to go away. So 1 Thessalonians is Paul's letter because he couldn't physically be with them. He still wanted to admonish them and exhort them through that letter. So that's what 1 Thessalonians is. In a nutshell, it substituted Paul's presence, what he wanted to say. And then in between 1 and 2 Thessalonians, there's a handful of months that goes by where Paul has to send another letter, and that is the letter that we are looking at today. So I wanted to put a framework around this passage in 2 Thessalonians for us today of this idea of what Christians who turn the world upside down, what they do. So I got three points on that as we exposit 2 Thessalonians tonight. The first uh, point is this. Uh, let me go back to it. Christians will turn the world upside down by enduring persecution faithfully. That sometimes sounds like a mute point. You know, we hear a lot about persecution if you've been in Christian circles enough. And in America, and Rolla, Missouri, maybe that doesn't specifically resonate with us. If you're like me, 
It's sometimes a muted point because we just think we don't really encounter that a lot. But it is certainly in our text uh, tonight. Look at 2 Thessalonians verses 4 to 10 with me. Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica, Therefore we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. What a picture there. Verse 9, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. Listen, they wouldn't have heard anything from Paul. There would have been nothing to believe if Paul didn't endure persecution faithfully, right? I mean, that's the whole, he had to take a leave of violence, so to speak, from this place just so it could happen. Think of what happened to Jason, that guy in Acts 17 that we read. He's dragged, he's persecuted, he's attacked, he's maligned in court, he's collected from. It cost him a financial price. If, if you, let's just make this base, let's agree to agree on this point that in general, about every hour, whether you're on Yahoo or some news channel or show or reading some newspaper or just on your phone randomly or just around people, almost every hour, if not half hour, there is bad news being reported, correct? That's just a general observation that just resonates with everyone. Whether you're in America or anywhere else in the world, it is just this inevitable result of the curse of sin that happened in Genesis 3. It just keeps getting worse and worse and compounds and compounds and compounds. I think Paul is writing this to encourage them and say, hey, don't be surprised when persecution happens. And look what will happen. You know, that's what he says there in verses 6 through 10 is like, when Jesus comes back, I mean, did you see that word picture there in verses 8, 9, 10? Look at that again. It's like, when Jesus comes back, he's going to wipe out evil once and for all. More on that word in just a second. But look at verse 5 specifically in chapter 1. To quote Paul, Christians who are worthy of the kingdom of God will suffer, just as a common principle. It's this whole idea of following, being a Christian is to follow the way of Christ. And to follow the way of Christ means that it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows for Jesus, was it? It wasn't just hey, let the kids come to me, you know, rebuking the disciples. No, it was taking 39 lashes of muscle out of his back, getting a crown of thorns put on his head, having a spear jabbed into his side, suffering for six hours, being tortured quite literally to death. That's what suffering looked like for Christ. And as we may not get crucified or physically persecuted, persecution is promised to happen. I want you to take a look at this verse up here. Because in 2 Thessalonians 1.1, 1, 1, look at the people that are all over this letter, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. So in 2 Timothy, when Paul's writing to Timothy, he says this truth. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Look at that word, will. I want you to circle it, underline it, hug it, embrace it, get used to it. Because what it doesn't say is that indeed all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus might be persecuted, could be persecuted, but What? Anybody seen it up there? What's that W word? Will. In other words, you can take it to the bank. It's a surefire promise for everyone in the room who calls Christ Lord. It's going to happen in some form or fashion. In other words, all believers experience unbelieving hostility in some form or fashion. You know, no one, I, I don't know of anyone that's ever got this verse on a coffee mug, a bumper sticker. I promise you, no one in the entire world has a tattoo of 2 Timothy 3.12, right? We don't often offer that in like an evangelistic spiel, right? Like if we're just trying to convert someone to Christ, like, hey man, you get to suffer with me for the rest of our lives. You want to join in, <laughs> right? That, that just would not resonate with anyone across the board. But how true is the word will? It's true, right? That's a word from the Lord for us today and tonight for sure. And for the rest of our lives, knowing that suffering is a part of being a disciple of Christ. Look at chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Just draw your attention to this as we're covering this uh, holistically tonight. i got to move fairly quickly. Verses 8 and 9 of chapter 2 of our book in 2 Thessalonians, Paul continues. He says, then the lawless one. The lawless one is really this embodiment, this manifestation of evil, encompassing all evil. 
the way I understand it. Verse 8, then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. Man, I hope that is good news for somebody tonight. It's very graphic language, but isn't it good to know that upon Jesus' return, all he's going to do is go, and all evil is done for all eternity. Amen? Does that excite anybody in here tonight? Man, when I think about 2 Thessalonians 2, 8 and 9, I'm thinking like, man, that's why I say like every half hour, every hour, we're looking at the news, whatever. It's evil. It's sin. It's wickedness taking over the world. It says in Ephesians that Satan himself is the prince of the power of the air, that he has supernatural power. And if without Jesus, we would be suppressed and in his domain of darkness forever. But praise God that Jesus is going to kill the lawless one with the breath of his mouth and bring evil to nothing at the appearance of his coming. Uh, my friend Titus Benton, he had put this out. I used to always pray if I learned about uh, a group of people or an individual being specifically physically persecuted, I would always pray for that to stop. Lord, please stop that persecuted situation and please deliver them from that and let that not happen anymore. And my friend Titus Benton rightly pointed out that we shouldn't be praying that persecution would stop, but that we would be faithful in it. And I think that's important to remember as disciples of Christ. Uh, it's got me thinking about this text in 2 Samuel 24, 24. Um, in 2 Samuel 24, King David is taking a census. And it's not just a governmental census. It's kind of like a pride census. It's kind of what happens in a lot of churches. I see this all over the place. What, how much offering did we get today? How many people were here? I'm like, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care because I've read 2 Samuel 24. Guess what happened after David took this census and was trying to boost his pride or whatever it was? It says that a plague broke out amongst the Israelites, and guess how many people died because of this? 70,000, it says in 2 Samuel 24. And so David's trying to reconcile the situation, obviously, like, wow, I was the one that caused this. And 70,000 people's bloods are on my hands. And so he's trying to build a, a sacrifice, build an altar to the Lord to appease the wrath of God. And so he goes to this guy's field in 2 Samuel 24. And the guy is just a citizen under King David. And he's like, here, have all the materials you need for free. You know, just, you're King David. And what David says in 2 Samuel 24, 24, I hope you remember it the rest of your life. He says, I will not offer to the Lord my God, which costs me nothing. And he goes on to pay a price for it. And my point is that, think about Nick's sermon last week in Malachi when he was talking about leftovers. You remember this? Three people. That's good, Nick. Wherever you're at, three people. Got it. In Malachi 1, I want to actually draw a different part of that chapter, is that the, the Lord actually says in Malachi 1.10, he says, if, if all you're doing is bringing me stuff that doesn't cost you anything, if your Christianity doesn't cost you anything, your relationship with God doesn't cost you anything, he says, don't even open the doors to the temple in Malachi 1.10. He says, don't even get the fire going for the altar, for offerings. Just don't, I'd rather you not even offer anything if it doesn't cost you something. Which leads me to this observation, and that is, what is your Christianity costing you? Which leads me to this statement, if there, it's, if there's no cost, it's not Christianity. You know, some people, it's easy. How many, how many are Christians in this room? Everyone raise their hand, right? Yeah, exactly. And it's like, okay. And you know what James just expounds in his epistle in the New Testament? He says, well, you raise your hand, that's great. Well, you walk the walk, that's great. Or talk the talk, rather. But show it in deeds. Show it where it costs us something. Like, da like King David, offer something to the Lord that costs something. Because the Lord is very clear in Malachi, if it's not costing you anything, don't call it Christianity, right? So I want to get on to moving. I think I've hammered that enough. Let's move on to this next point, that Christians will turn the world upside down by betting on Christ's second coming. There's a big, it's a big topic between 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Uh, Paul mentions it in 1st Thessalonians, namely in chapter 4 uh, and 5-2 as well, the Lord coming like a thief in the night. And uh, what had happened in between those handful of months between First and Second Thessalonians is there was a lot of confusion about what the Lord's second coming would look like. Matter of fact, there were supposedly people in Thessalonica that were communicating to other Christians and maybe just people in general that the Lord had already came, that they missed him. And it was created a lot of insecurity 
and doubt among the Christians in Thessalonica. Look at 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 2 with me. It says, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. And so again, people are communicating all different things. It's creating chaos. You ever heard or read somebody like someone quoting from a prophecy of Daniel like, oh, the Lord's coming is going to happen on October 11th, 2019 at 7.30 p.m. because Daniel 5.12 says A, B, C, D, E, F, G. You ever heard that stuff? Just don't listen to that. That's just a total bunch of crap. You, the reason I say it's a bunch of crap is because we know what Jesus said about his second coming in the Gospels. When pressed on when he was going to come back, you know what he said? He said, I don't even know the date. Only the Father knows the date. And so let's not get caught up in trying to predict the dates and create chaos, but let's nonetheless be hopeful and living for Christ's return every day. Let's be betting on it. Let's be betting that it's going to happen today and tomorrow and every day. We should be living in that way all the time. Look at uh, verses 16 and 17 of chapter 2 as well. Paul concludes that topic. He says, now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. I think what Paul is saying to us, saying to the Thessalonican Christians and to us today in 2019, reading the letter 2,000 years later, is saying it's always a good bet to bet that Jesus is coming back again. Amen? Check this out. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, in the letter right before this, he says specifically uh, in verse 13, but we do not want you to be uninformed brothers. Brothers is a term of people who are in Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ, about those who are asleep, those who are physically dead, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. I've lost track of how many eulogies I've done as a minister, and I have to say the majority of the ones that I've done are for people who had a faith lived out in Christ, but I've also done some who did not have a living faith in Christ whatsoever. Two different sides of the coin. And Paul says in that first letter to Thessalonica, he says, people can grieve in one of two ways over their dead relative or friend. If they were in Christ, it's celebratory, right? It's hopeful because there's life after death. That's what he's saying there. But others who live without Christ in their life and die they have to grieve without hope. How devastating is that? You probably know people, my aunt, people in your family that you've had to grieve over hopelessly because they were not in Christ. He goes on to say, four verses later in verse 17, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and we will always be with the Lord. And he goes on to say, verse 18, encourage each other with these words. And so I want us to realize the truth of betting on Jesus' second coming. It's always wise to bet on Jesus. I want to come back to Acts 17, what I read at the beginning, the roots of the Thessalonican church. Look at the response. Paul's just going around. He's preaching Christ crucified all the time. Very simple message, right? It just says, and Paul went in, as was his custom, on three Sabbath days. He reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it's necessary for the Christ to suffer, to rise from the dead, and saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is a Christ. Very simple message, not complicated at all, simple to understand. And it says, and some of them, that is the Jews who were in the synagogue, believed Paul and were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas. But look at the other two demographics. It says that a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. If you know anything about Greek history and first century, you know they're super educated, super philosophical bunch, and all these prominent women as well going around. And so Paul's preaching this simple message of Christ crucified. He died for our sins, sacrificial atoning death to cover us from the wrath of God and give us eternal life and rise from the dead. And it says that Jews were believing that. It says that devout Greeks were believing that message and prominent leading women were believing that. I mean, what makes a first century Greek person put all their marbles in one bag? You think that's going to cause some friction with all their friends and all their family are saying, really, you're believing this Christian stuff? But for them, it was super real. Does, the, does judgment day, when I say that word, does that scare you at all? Anybody? Sometimes that used to scare me a lot. And I never thought that judgment day, when 
it, when Christ returns and we meet him in the air, it's going to be celebratory. That's what verse 17 highlighted, right? In 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. It's going to be celebratory. It's not scary. And that's what Paul's saying about this topic of Christ's second coming. He's saying instead of it inspiring fear within us, it should inspire hope and action. I want you to take a look at this list that I have provided for us today. Usually we do a lot of uh, word studies on different words throughout the passage, and I've never studied the name of Jesus in a book. And I thought, I wonder, you know, if Paul's really driving home, like banking on Jesus' second coming, what does he just say about Jesus in the letter of 2 Thessalonians? So take a look at this. That phrase, the Lord Jesus or our Lord Jesus, appears 12 times in 2 Thessalonians. So just hang with me here, okay? I'll go pretty quick. If you're interested in the references, you can get at me after the service. So what Paul says about Jesus is that Jesus is the head of the church, 1-1. Jesus offers grace and peace, 1-2. Jesus will grant relief to those who are persecuted, 1-7. Jesus is the gospel. Jesus' name is glorified. Jesus is coming, and we will be gathered together with him. Jesus will bring evil to nothing upon his return. Jesus' glory is obtainable for me and you. Jesus gives us eternal comfort and good hope through grace. Jesus' name is authoritative. Jesus should chiefly motivate us to work hard, and Jesus' grace is available to all. I hope that excites some of us today and gets us pumped up about Jesus for the rest of our life. Paul is reminding the Thessalonican church, remember everything that Jesus can offer, and it's worth going all in on Jesus because he can meet every single need, physical, earthly, and namely, eternal. And so this was good news received from the Thessalonican church, no doubt about it. Paul wanted them to be confident in what Jesus has done and will do when he returns. Here's my final observation about 2 Thessalonians, this third major theme, uh, just going chapter by chapter. Chapter 1 is talking about the persecution. Chapter 2, talking about the Lord's second coming and the battle of the lawless one against Christ, which will all Jesus has to do is go, and he's done. Then we get to chapter 3, and check this out. It says in chapter 3, verse 1, Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you. Paul's not satisfied with, um, he's not content with, hey, I've planted a lot of churches, hey, I've done a lot of missionary journeys, hey, I've been getting persecuted my entire life as a Christian. He continues on going. Now read with me verses 6 to 15, a big part of 2 Thessalonians 3, a huge theme in 2 Thessalonians, no doubt. It says in verse 6 and following of chapter 3, Paul says, Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness, circle that word, and not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle, circle that word again, when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would not give you this, we would, we would give you this command, rather. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some of you walk in idleness, circle that word for the third time again, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with them that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother." Interesting. Leads me to this third observation tonight, and that is Christians will turn the world upside down by refusing to be idle. As I highlighted for you three times, Paul mentions that topic, that problem, that sin that existed in the church. How many of you think of idleness as like a flagrant sin as a Christian? That's how many I thought probably would raise their hands, like a couple like, oh, I don't know, you're kind of like drawing it out for us, so maybe, you know. It's like, Take note, two different times Paul uses this strong phrase, let me get there, in verse 6. Look at what he says. We command you, me, Sylvanus, and Timothy, we command you, brothers, Christian people in Thessalonica, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says it again in verse 12. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ. Does that sound like an opinion to you? Does that sound like a suggestion? No, it does not. It sounds like an authoritative command coming from an apostle who has seen the living Christ and has that authority to command other Christians 
in that way. It's interesting to me what the word idol means in our text. Um, again, going back to these word studies, it always fascinates me when I find a word that's only used like one or just a couple times. The word idol in Second Thessalonians is used two times in the whole New Testament, in verse 6 and verse 12 of our passage. And what it means is literally that it gives this word picture of soldiers marching out of order, a soldier quitting their rank, or a soldier neglecting duty. How's that for a word picture of what was happening at the Thessalonican church? That people who were the official representatives of Christ, Christians, were just being idle with their status as Christian. They were just simply not advancing the kingdom of God. They were marching out of order. They were simply maybe even quitting or neglecting their Christian duty. A Christian always, always, always looks different than the world, right? Francis Chan had this to say, something is wrong when believers' lives make sense to unbelievers. That's the truth. I mean, that's the whole reason Israel is set apart, right? I just got done saying this at youth group, is that the word holy literally means to be set apart. That's the whole reason God gives them a different dietary code, can't wear denim jeans, can't eat shrimp, my favorite fruit. All the, you know, they looked different, they smelled different, they did weird stuff, they had different ceremony laws. It was all to set them apart because Christians always look different from the world. I want to tell you about this assignment that I had in college because idleness was certainly could be describing me throughout college. Uh, I worked hard, I was focused on good grades, but at the end of the day, I was a pretty idle person, just kind of coasting, doing whatever felt good, uh, hanging out with friends, whatever. And I thought about this during my internship at a church I was at between my junior year of college and my senior year of college, we were given an assignment. It was a time management schedule. Doesn't that just already sound awesome, right? Like how many college people love time management schedules, right? Maybe a couple of our organizational people, right? Like, yes, I do love that. I actually have one filled out currently. <laughs> we had to do a time management schedule. How this looked on an Excel sheet was that we had to log everything from Sunday to Saturday, a full seven days in 15 minute increments. What we did every 15 minutes. So what are you doing at 2.45 a.m.? Sleeping. What are you doing at two, three o'clock? Sleep, you know, so on and so forth. So every 15 minutes, I'm logging what I'm doing for seven days. Then, part of the assignment was to make five observations that are self examined after we self examined of what that sheet looked like. Like, hmm, how can I use my time more wisely? How can I not be as idle, right? And so I wanted to share that with you because it was super uh, edifying to me. And I still think about that assignment I had, even though I was unhappy to receive it. I'm super glad that it happened because it has made me think of Colossians 4, where Paul says to the church in Colossae, make the best use of the time as Christians. Make the best use of your time. And sometimes, if we're honest as college kids, we just don't make the best use of our time, right? Like, no one wants to come up here and give a testimony on that, but I think we're all in agreement that we're not the best at making the best use of our time. And I want to tell you this specifically as college students, because thinking back, I'm only like seven years, whatever, removed from college, is that whatever your hab habits are currently, whether that be spiritual disciplines or lack thereof, or just day-to-day -day habits and practices, whatever your practices and disciplines are right now, currently, tonight, as a college student, it will bleed over after you graduate into adulthood. I promise you that. Because I'm a living example of how it is so hard to break these habits that we form for like four plus years and just think, oh, you know, I'm going to go off, get a job, be an adult, get married, have kids, you know, whatever. And you just can't get out of that funk as fast as you will. Whatever you're doing now, I promise you'll be doing it five years from now. Take that to the bank, no doubt. So think about what college habits should continue for you and what college habits should change for you. The big problem with idleness in the church in Thessalonica, what Paul's getting at, is actually not... Um, not an economic problem so much, it's a fellowship problem. Because what people were doing, because they thought the Lord's coming either already happened or was like gonna happen tonight or tomorrow, they, would ju they just quit working. And the first century church was like hyper generous, so they were creating extra burdens on other Christians in their territory to provide for them. They were what we would call moochers. Do you know any one of those in college? Who, you know, I had a friend, he would always get Lil Caesar's pizza. He was my roommate. This dude, we literally named him, I didn't think I'd share this, but I'm already going there, so. 
I was the best man at his wedding. He, I nicknamed him Hot and Ready because he went to Little Caesars like literally all the time, right? He was trying to save up his freshman year for an engagement ring to his girlfriend. He literally, we calculated it, he spent over two grand once, once full school year just on Hot and Ready pizzas. That's a true story, I promise you. That averaged out to a little over one and a half pizzas a day. One dinner time, I'm asking, I'm telling him, I'm like, dude, like I came back from dinner, you know, it's like an hour or so removed. It's like eight o'clock, I'm getting hungry again, like every college guy does at least. And I'm like, he's got like eight slices of a hot and ready. I'm like, dude, can I get one of those? He's like, no. <laughs> I'm like, dude, are you serious? Like, really? Like, you can't give me one slice. He's like, no, I'm going to eat all of it. So I probably did a deal with him or like paid him 20 bucks or whatever, like to get one stinking slice of his pizza. The point is here, right? Let me bring it full circle, okay? <laughs> Got a little rabbit trail. My brain goes a little haywire sometimes. I knew you wanted to know that story, so that's why I shared it. I can't even think where I was going with that, so let's just get back to idleness. <laughs> Got him. This idea of refusing to be idle and mooching and just always relying on other people. There it is. I was relying on him for the pizza. That's where it was going. It was a huge problem with this church in Thessalonica because they weren't taking ownership of their Christianity, of their responsibility to live responsibly as a Christian, to have good work ethic, to work hard, physically speaking and spiritually speaking as well. This is why this was such a toxic problem. I just have a couple of verses I want to share with you. This, I actually quote this in my, all the marriage ceremonies I do. Proverbs 21, 25 says, the desire of, a sluggard, of the sluggard kills him, for his hands refuse to labor. They just are so fixated on remaining idle. That that is the definite. Another proverb uh, that talks about the sluggard is a sluggard is someone like uh, rolls around on his bed like a door does on its hinges. You know anybody like that? Like, I just can't stop watching this whole season tonight, right? Like, I cannot get out of it. It's just this refusal to work, to do homework, to be active in the kingdom, whatever it looks like. Paul even says there in those verses 6 through 12, he says, remember the example that we said. I had a full-time job, and I was doing full-time ministry on the side. We read in Acts 18.3 that Paul was a tent maker by trade, that Paul is calling them back. Hey, remember my example that I set for you. Make sure to follow that same example. And lastly, here in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul's writing to the church in Corinth. He says this very simple yet very potent verse. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. How many of you would feel confident to get up on stage tonight and say, I want everyone in the room to follow me 24-7 because I'm, with every second, every decision, every action, every inaction, I'm going to always be pointing us to Christ. Yeah, right. No one's, no one's going to volunteer for that, right? Because it's like, oh, I don't feel that confident about my walk with Christ. But Paul did say that. Isn't that interesting? That he got to this point. It's almost like if we were to put a GoPro on your shoulder and just do a live feed for like 24-7, like what we do in private and in public to say everything I do quite literally in my life is fixated on imitating Christ, right? I just shared that with my youth group last night, and it's like, they're like, oh, you know, I don't know if I'm ready for that. And same response, and that is my response too, because we don't know. I remember being in a college class. I think it was a night class I was in. I was in the very back row. How many of you are back row people in rooms? Because, like, it's just easy to say how the professors, yeah, yeah, right? We got at least 20 honest people in the room. And so I'm in the back row, right, you know, just trying to stay out of eyesight with the professor and chill. Well, I woke up during that class, which is never a good sign, right? Because if you wake up, what inevitably happened? You fell asleep, so that was awesome. So I literally had like these light gray sweatpants on, uh, and by light gray, like super light, like almost white sweatpants, and I woke up with my head cocked like this with my mouth open, and that's never good. I literally had a pool of slobber, I'm not kidding you, like a pork chop sized pool of slobber right on my thigh, and the greatest part was that it was still attached to my mouth being cocked. 
And I just, so you know, you wake up and you're like, you know, doing one of these numbers, like, oh man, you know, like, you know, looking around, does a professor see you, who else saw you? And you're like trying to act all cool, like I don't have a huge pork chop slobber stain <laughs> on my sweatpants, I don't got slobber all over my beard or whatever. It reminded me of kind of this attitude that the disciples originally had in Acts chapter 110 after Jesus ascends into heaven. You know, between his resurrection and his ascension was 40 days. And Jesus ascends into heaven. He tells him to go get ready. You know, the Holy Spirit's coming. Uh, and, and Acts 2 is about to be lit on fire, like quite literally. And, and it says that the disciples, why they were gazing into heaven. You know, it's just, a, that's what I think idleness looks like. It looks like me just like having slobber all over my mouth. Or it looks like us just sitting in our hands, just like gazing into heaven. I'm ready for Jesus to come back. I'm saved. I'm good. I go to Catalyst every week. I'm a Christian, blah, 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 blah. You know, it's like, listen, if that's the total embodiment of your relationship with Jesus, that's not a relationship with Jesus. I hate to say that. It's not gazing into heaven, but it's having that hope, knowing that I'm going to be waiting, but I'm going to be working while I'm waiting. And that's what Paul gets at in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 here. Live as every day is the Lord's day. I'll close with this verse, okay? I want to I wanna make this observation. I've always thought that this was super interesting. 1 Kings 6 is where King Solomon is building the temple of the Lord. And, you know, it takes a lot of work, a lot of tools, a lot of time. It says, in the 11th year, in the month of Bull, which is the 8th month, the house was finished in all its parts and according to all its specifications, he, Solomon, was seven years in building it, okay? The biggest thing I want you to take note of is how long did it take to build the temple of the Lord? Seven years, right? Look at the very next verse, 1 Kings 7.1. Solomon was building his own house how many years? Thirteen, and he finished his entire house. So how many years, temple? How many for Solomon's house? Almost a two-to-one ratio, and if you know the story of King Solomon, that's exactly what happens. He starts off in chapter 3 when God gives him any wish, and he says, hey, give me wisdom to be a discerning ruler, all this stuff. Great. He's wanting to build God's kingdom to administer justice. But then slowly but surely, he starts going over here, and he wants to build his own kingdom. And all of his hope is in his riches and his women and his political alliances and being the most powerful, wisest man on earth, hold Jesus. And it, like, it really got me thinking about this truth that what you hope for shapes what you live for. I think that's what Paul's final word to the church in Thessalonica would communicate, is make sure that your foundation is betting on Jesus' second coming. And if you're betting, if you're all in, if all your marbles are in one bag that Jesus is coming back again and that we will live with him forever, that is paradise for sure. If you're betting on that, then you need to endure persecution faithfully and you need to stop being idle. You need to get busy. You need to get working. Jesus himself has turned the world upside down, right? I mean, this whole idea that one man, the Son of God, could come, live totally sinless, totally righteous, live totally perfect. R.C. Sproul said it best. Jesus didn't just die for our sins. He lived for our righteousness first. His death on the cross is null and void. doesn't matter for anything if he didn't live perfectly. He lived perfectly for our righteousness, died entirely for our sins, was buried, rose bodily from the grave, and is coming back again so that we can be with him forever. And this Christianity movement has turned the world upside down. My invitation to you tonight as I close is will you join in with Paul and the Thessalonican church to say, I'm all in on betting on Jesus' second coming. And I'm going to show you that I'm all in by how I'm not going to be idle anymore, how I'm going to not refuse to work anymore. I'm going to have hands that are working. I'm going to be praying for people who are being persecuted. I'm going to pray that I would be fearless and faithful in the midst of persecution, hostility from unbelievers. I'm going to always bet on Jesus' second coming. And I'm going to work just as hard as Paul did playing these churches using my sphere of influence to point people to Jesus, to say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Will you pray with me? <laughs> Jesus, we thank you for how good you are to us. I mean, this whole con we use grace, the word grace all the time. It's, we have to really think of the Christian lingo we use sometimes. Grace is literally this idea that everything that you, Jesus, have done for us is undeserved, it's unmerited. We can't buy it, we can't earn it with any good works. We are totally helpless without the grace of Jesus. And so Paul traveled to Thessalonica and he pronounced that gospel of grace, that Jesus suffered and he died and he rose again. Just a very simple message. Lord, I pray if there's any maybe unbelievers in our midst today, that they would believe that truth. 
just like the devout Greeks and the leading women in Thessalonica, that they would say, you know what? I believe that. I'm going to step out in faith and bet on Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection and his second coming. Lord, if that is true for any of us in the room, let us put our money where our mouth is and not just be able to say, raise our hands when someone asks, are we a Christian? But let us show it day by day. Jesus says in John 15, they will know my disciples by the fruit that they bear. May we have a hard work ethic in any physical jobs, financial jobs that we have, but most importantly, may we be actively exhausting ourselves for the kingdom of God to be advanced. May we, like Paul, water and plant seeds of the kingdom everywhere we go and pray that you, God, would give supernatural growth to them. Lord, I pray for everyone in this room. I pray that Jesus is real to them. I pray that their faith never deviates from the Son of God. He is good. He is true. He's going to wipe out and exterminate evil with his breath on his second coming. We look forward to the day where we get to meet the Lord in the air with all our brothers and sisters. Lord, I'm banking on that. All my marbles are in that bag. The question is, what about everyone else in here? Lord, I pray that as we process tonight's word from you, that if anyone feels led to go to an officer or leader, to any of the staff at CCF or myself, I pray that they would reach out, that the Lord's heavy hand would be on these people tonight and that you would convict us in what we need to change and what we need to keep constant at both sides. God, we love you. We thank you so much for the grace of your son, Jesus. It's in his name that we pray.